You know, one of the things that we are told about the 1950 World Cup is that it holds one of the most significant events in the history of international football and indeed in the history of World Cups. Um, and one of the biggest tragedies for one major footballing powerhouse, which is Brazil. Uh, for those who may not know what the Maracanazo is, it was a footballing event that occurred in the final game of the 1950 World Cup, which was hosted in Brazil between Uruguay and Brazil, host nation and their neighbors and rivals, Los, Las Charuas. Now, there was no official World Cup final in 1950. The final phase of the tournament was a four-group, uh, a four-team group where the team that won the group in the end would win the tournament. It just happened to be coincidentally that the very last match between Uruguay and Brazil was the decider. But because Brazil had so dominated Spain and Sweden earlier on, it means that they only needed a draw. And that's the thing. Brazil only needed a draw against Uruguay at home in the Maracanã to win their first ever World Cup. And indeed, Brazil took the lead 1-0 just after the start of the second half through Friazza in the 47th minute. One of the most famous Brazilian players of all time, well, now infamous, but we'll get to that in a moment. Before uh, Andre Schiaffino and Alcides Gigi, a legendary Uruguayan player I mentioned before on my channel, scored the winner and silenced the Maracanã in the 79th minute. Attendance that day was said to be so jam-packed that the Maracanã had thousands of extra people in it than it could actually hold. Uh, some people say there, was, there were as many as nearly a quarter million attendees in the stadium that day, around 200 or so thousand people, the most ever for a single World Cup final. And Asides Gigia, God rest his soul, who passed away a few years ago, the last living survivor of that final, the man who scored the winning goal, said that uh, there are only three people that have silenced the Maracanã, the Pope, Frank, Frank Sinatra, and me. And indeed, when you go back and you look at the old, the old footage from that, uh, from that day, you could see that Brazilians watching in attendance were very visibly upset and shocked. The magnitude of this match was felt so hard because Brazil was celebrating before the game took place as if they had already won the tournament. There was mass parades that were scheduled in addition to the parades that had already taken place. FIFA president at that time, Jules Rimet, actually prepared a speech in Portuguese to congratulate the Brazilian team. And when Uruguay won, he had to scrap it at the last minute and come up with something new. So this was something that was viewed as set in stone because of the circumstances, because of what Brazil needed to win the tournament, and because of the fact that Brazil were overwhelming favorites. Now, Uruguay at this time were still a footballing force, but this was about 20 to 25 years removed from the Olympic team of the 1920s and the Uruguayan national team of 1930. But since that day, Brazilians have referred to this sort of disaster as the Maracanazo because it took place in the Estadio do Maracanã. And they view Uruguay as sort of that ghost, that ghost of the Maracanã. And in the aftermath of this game, there was despair. And a lot of the players who would have had their name go up in lights ended up becoming much maligned by the public. And a lot of them retired soon afterwards and were hated everywhere they went, unfortunately. So now that I lay the background, we're almost five minutes in. I want to talk about what I think would have happened um, in this alternate timeline where the Maracanazo doesn't happen. Brazil gets at least a draw to secure their first ever World Cup championship. And in honor of the five-time world champions, I want to give you 
five things, five things I think would have happened. Three of them are obvious, and two of them require some further thinking. But I want to talk about the three things that are obvious. Number one, the footballing world as neutrals would have lost a true historical gem that day because this lives on in the memory of those who were alive to witness it and it lives on in the annals of footballing history and stories that we tell each other and pass each other down of the Maracana, what Uruguay did, the, la the last sort of punch of a then powerhouse that was on the way out. And indeed, Uruguay have not won a World Cup since 1950. So this was one of this was the very first real, I think, shock result in a World Cup final in the history of the World Cup. And it makes for amazing storytelling because it's an actual event. It, it, it happened. It's, it's literal history. So from a ro romantic sort of neutral perspective, if we didn't have the Maracanazo, it would be great for Brazilian fans, but we would also be sort of robbed of that not even necessarily underdog story because Uruguay were still a force in football at that time, but robbed of a sort of a, of an unlikely story in world football. And that's number one. The second thing that is I, that I feel is sort of obvious is that it would have cemented Brazil as a powerhouse in world football a full eight years before they actually did when they won the World Cup for the first time in 1958. 1958, I'll get to that in a moment, because that ties into my, one of my fifth re, uh, things I think would have happened if the Maracanazo never occurred. But Brazil would have officially emerged about almost a decade earlier than they actually did. Now, even by the time 1938 rolled around in the 1940s, the international football, I know we didn't have the World Cup at all in the 1940s due, due to World War II, Brazil was cementing itself as a contender. But for Brazil to have officially splashed onto the scene as uh, one of the big dogs, the 1950 World Cup at home, they would have, would have won it so comfortably the way that they dispatched Sweden and, and Spain, other teams in the world at that time who were among the best, it would have really brought them, it would have, um, whatever the opposite of delaying the inevitable is, right? So 1958 was when Brazil really forcefully came on the scene, but it really would have been 1950 in the sweetest way possible for Brazil, which was on home soil. The third most obvious thing I think that would have come from this would you would have players like the goalkeeper Monacir Barbosa, uh, Friazza, the man who scored the only goal for Brazil in that game. You would have had uh, Ademir and Zizinho. Instead of becoming laughingstocks of the national team and, and one of the more, I think, very harshly, 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 undeservedly disgraced generation of football, of Brazilian football players, they would have become kings. They would have become, their name would have gone up forever in the history of Brazilian football as being the first uh, starting 11 to win a World Cup for the team that would go on to become the most successful nation in the history of the World Cup. So the fact that they are hated by the Brazilian public. And I remember up until the 2014 World Cup, you had the granddaughter of the Brazilian goalkeeper in 1950, Barbosa, after the Minerazo, where G Brazil lost 7-1 to Germany, said that she now thinks her, her grandfather's soul can rest because you had another tragedy that happened in a Brazil World Cup on Brazilian soil that sort of now overshadows the Maracana, the Maracanazo. Um, and it's overall just a tragic reflection of what might have been, because if they had indeed just gotten that draw, just gotten that draw against Uruguay,
they would be some of the most famous Brazilian players of all time, but now they're the most infamous. Um, and it's just funny how things work out that way. How history can change, the narrative of history can just change that soon. On one event, in one day, on a sunshining day in Brazil. Now let's move on to the two other things I think would have happened. I mentioned three things I think were obvious. But there's two more things that I um I think are that can be debated. It can generate some disagreement, and that's fine. Uh, reason uh no well, thing number four rather sort of ties into what I said about Brazil uh emerging as as a powerhouse early. Well, it sort of delayed Brazil from being taken seriously in world football until 1958. Because even when Brazil got to the 1958 World Cup, they were on the receiving end of not just racism by the Swedish and European press, of the Brazilian team who traveled to Sweden for that World Cup, they were under undermined and underestimated every step of the way. I believe it was the Swedish coach who Brazil destroyed in the final, um, who said that Brazilian players, they don't have like the mentality, they don't have the, the, the grit, they don't have the ability to, to see games through. And I also think that you don't have that extra motivation for Brazil to win a World Cup after the humiliation of 1950. So that so sort of served to pr propel Brazil to their first ever title eight years later, in extreme northern Europe, in Sweden, instead of on home soil. The fifth thing that I think would have happened, and this one is controversial, it would have just a little bit, just a little bit, put a sort of blemish on the legacy of Pelé. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, Pelé, we all know before Kyle Mbappe in 2018 against Croatia, Pelé scored a goal for Brazil in the 1958 World Cup final when he emerged on the scene as a 17-year-old kid. And it would be another 60 years this past summer where a 19-year-old Kylie Mbappe scored in the final of uh, the 2018 World Cup. And the 1958 World Cup was not just a time when Pelé emerged on the scene, but also that generation of Brazilian players that would eventually go on to win three of the next four World Cups, something that is and still remains unprecedented. So 1958, 1962, and 1970. Who knows what Brazil would have done in 66 if Pelé wasn't injured? Who knows? But what really helped Pelé was the fact that Brazil had won their, their very first World Cup under him. And a, a generation of other great players like Jairzinho, and Carlos Alberto in 1970. But that was when Pelé became known to the world. And the fact that when Brazil won the 1958 World Cup so convincingly when they beat Sweden 5-2 to two in the final was when they started to gain real international notoriety. That You had a f the first time since you know a country outside of Uruguay and outside of Europe have won the World Cup from South America. And then that country would then go on to become five-time world champions. If Brazil had won the World Cup eight years prior in 1950, you know how people say there's nothing like your first love? Well, if Brazil had won again in 1958, it would have been their second world title in eight years. And Pelé still would have made a name for himself. He still would go down as one of the greatest players of all time. But 
one of the chinks in his uh, in his armor is that he was part of the first Brazilian team to win a World Cup, and the first is generally in all aspects of life is generally the sweetest, or at least it's the most remember uh, memorable, right? So I actually think in that sort of odd way, Pelé's, uh, the gravitas that he holds in the conversation of greatest of all time, he's helped by the fact that he was part of the Brazilian team that won it for the first time. And he's helped by the fact that Brazil did not win it eight years previously. You know, he would have had sort of what Maradona, one of the few, very few things Maradona has going against him. Maradona didn't win the World Cup. Argentina did not win its first World Cup under Maradona. They won it under Mario Kempis. And they won it on home soil in 1978. Maradona started playing for Argentina in 1982. And then he won their second World Cup title in 1986. Now, that, that has not prevented Maradona from being in the conversation as the greatest of all time. I personally think Maradona is the, is the best of all time. But it is one thing that he has going against him. So the whole aura of invincibility around Pelé, the whole greatness argument, and the whole narrative building up between 1950 the disappointment of it, the national tragedy, because that's really how it was treated in Brazil in 1950 as a national tragedy. And you have what they did in 1958, far away from home. A lot of people had discounted them because they flopped. They kind of flopped on home soil. It, it helps Pelé. Now, I can't stress this enough. If Pelé features in his first ever World Cup and Brazil wins its second title, no, that doesn't mean that we're looking at a timeline where he's not even in the conversation for, because that's just silly. We look at what he did afterward. He's the only player in the history of the World Cup to win the World, to win the World Cup three times, 1958, 62, and 70. Just because another crop of Brazilian players before him did it, that doesn't mean that he's now, you know, not even in the conversation. Of course, he would still be in the conversation. But he would have just one little tiny thing going against him because of the fact that when Brazil won the World Cup in 1958, it was the first time. And they had finally cracked through that elusive barrier that they had carried on their backs as a burden for so long. So those are five things I think would have happened if the Maracanazo never occurred. Those five things. Leave a comment below, like, subscribe, and I will see you later, God willing. Until then, everybody, have a good one. Much love and peace out.